So as I work on some of the other projects that I've alluded to recently on this channel, I've been seeing some debates sort of on Twitter lately uh, pertaining to the doctrine of limbo. And I just think it'd be a bit worthwhile to sort of give my take on it because I just think a lot of people take a somewhat of an overly simplistic view on it, which to me has negative consequences sometimes on people's spiritual lives. I mean, on the one hand, the idea that it's a given certitude that, you know, unbaptized infants are doomed to be eternally deprived of the beatific vision as a dogmatic fact, uh, that can be not only uh, depressing, but may even cast doubt on the universal salvific will of God, and, and that's obviously a horrible concept for a Catholic, particularly in his uh, spiritual life. Now, on the other hand, if we take the idea of an unbaptized infant being deprived of the beatific vision and simply write this off based on our emotional repugnance toward this idea, regardless of the very legitimate theological reasons the church has given and labored over throughout the centuries, then uh, we cheapen the deposit of faith and reduce it down to something that's just amenable and ultimately subordinate to our emotional states, which you know, takes away from the transcendence and ultimacy of divine revelation. So uh, I think we have to analyze this issue and carve out an explanation in light of the church's traditional theology on this issue, as well as in light of recent magisterial clarifications in order to synthesize all of these contributions to the unified magisterium of the church. Uh, and I think that synthesis will ultimately mitigate these extremes in a way that's uh, compatible with God's universal salvific will, as well as with the absolute necessity of baptismal grace for salvation and incorporation into Christ. So, obviously by limbo, we are referring to the limbo of the infants, not the limbo of the fathers. That is, it is the spiritual state of those who die with original sin alone, without the stain of personal sin, either venial or mortal. The only spiritual privation afflicted with such souls is really just the privation of original justice, which is the very essence of original sin. Now, Augustine, of course, spoke of original sin as though it was uh, synonymous with concupiscence, but of course, the later tradition articulated this more uh, precisely to refer essentially to, as I said, simply the privation of original justice. Now, that privation of original justice takes on the character of sin because God had originally intended for man to be made in harmony with him, both in the natural and the supernatural order. And so uh, when this supernatural harmony with him is deprived of man, then the spiritual state of man does not simply revert to sort of a, a purely neutral state, um, but in a state marked by opposition to his last end. It is for this reason that the word sin is used, to designate the hereditary privation of original justice, that is, original sin. Um, so, with that in mind, how do we situate the state of those who die in original sin just by itself, original sin alone? Um, for those who don't know, the idea that such souls would, uh, on the one hand, be deprived of the beatific vision, while on the other hand, be freed from any sort of subjective suffering, was not an idea that began in the Middle Ages by any means. Um, it was a common opinion among uh, many of the Greek fathers, for example, such as St. Gregory of Nyssa. Of course, this largely stemmed from uh, their understanding of original sin, which the church did not fully endorse in integrating Augustine's understanding of the topic. Nevertheless, the Latin scholastics who took up this view, partly from the Greek fathers themselves, were largely Augustinian, albeit with um, some modifications in their understanding of original sin. Um, so we shouldn't see the Greek father's more lenient take on the fate of unbaptized uh, infants as simply a result of their divergent view of original sin. Uh, this is just to say that the idea that uh, the limbo of the infant was a medieval invention is without merits. Now, in addition to that, uh, the idea that Augustine's opinion that the unbaptized infants suffered the pains of the damned uh, beyond the mere deprivation of the beatific vision, uh, the idea that this constitutes the universal consensus of the church prior to the Middle Ages, I think that is also without merit. 
Um, but let's turn now to the merit of these theories considered uh, in and of themselves in light of where the magisterium has landed on them. Now, while it is true that the Council of Carthage did reject as a Pelagian idea the existence of an intermediary state between heaven and hell for those who die in original sin alone, a few things should be kept in mind when contrasting that against the later scholastic schools of thought that had been later approved by the church. For one, the Council of Carthage was a local synod, and this cannot be seen of itself as dogmatically binding. For two, it is counteracted by a much weightier magisterial statement by uh, Pius VII, which condemns those who reject the notion that infants who die in original sin alone, well, while deprived of the beatific of vision, enjoy an eternity of natural happiness. Particularly, he condemns those who reject it as a Pelagian fable. Um, so it's safe to say here that the Augustinian Jansenist position that infants who die in original sin alone partake even lightly of the sufferings of the damned, I think it's safe to say that this view has been essentially rejected by the magisterium of the church. Um, now since then, up until fairly recently, the church has been uh, relatively content with uh, St. Thomas's position that infants who die in original sin, um, while they are indeed deprived of the beatific vision, and in this sense, the Council of Florence is right to refer to this as some form of a punishment. Uh, such infants feel no subjective pain or even disappointment because such infants would not even know of their uh, supernatural end since this knowledge itself is a result of divine revelation, which is only infused to us by grace. So within this view, um, the only thing that would remain for them is eternal natural happiness, the pinnacle of which is contemplative union with God uh, to the extent that is uh, possible short of the beatific vision. Now, as I said, within the last century, there has been uh, quite a lot of theological discussion about the possibility of infants by some act of divine mercy being admitted to a uh, heavenly beatitude despite their lack of the sacrament. And this culminated in uh, a recent Vatican declaration on the issue, which sought to sort of maneuver through possible ways in which that possibility could be realized within the bounds of orthodoxy. So in light of this, what is the best way to deal with this doctrine, in my judgment? Well, I think we have to be very careful not to be overly simplistic or dismissive, simply because either A, uh, we're moved too much by our emotions, uh, or B, we're overly cautious about what certain theologians of the past have said, uh, that we paralyze ourselves from discussing the issue with any sort of uh, prudential uh, flexibility. Uh, on the other hand, the doctrine of limbo is indeed predicated upon uh, an indisputable dogma, and that is, it is indeed uh, absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be infused with the grace of baptism, because everyone is born into a state of uh, privation, that privation of original justice, unless a man is born, reborn rather, into the state of original justice by virtue of of the infusion of sanctifying grace in the soul, it is metaphysically impossible for such a person to partake of the divine nature in the beatific vision. So because of this, if there are indeed souls who die in the state of this privation, it would of itself necessarily follow that they would be unable to enjoy the beatific vision because they would leave this world without the means by which the obediential potency of the soul is elevated to this deified state. The fundamental question, therefore, isn't so much whether limbo is doctrinally sound, because clearly it is. The question becomes rather a matter of contingent facts. Um, need it be conceded that such a state of affairs actually happens? That is, must we concede that there are, in fact, souls who die in the state of original sin alone? Uh, this does not by any means logically follow from the doctrinal soundness of limbo itself. The doctrinal soundness of limbo suffices as a conditional, but that conditional precisely as a conditional needn't be played out in concrete reality. And because of that, uh, we can simultaneously affirm the doctrinal soundness of limbo whilst acknowledging that it may in actual fact be empty. Now how can this be? Uh, lest anyone think that I'm uh, about to in modernist fashion, lawyer my way out of a traditional doctrine, I'll quote Ludwig Ott. Um, 
And he says, quote, Against the universality of the divine desire for salvation, it is objected that God does not necessarily and earnestly desire the salvation of children dying without baptism. To this it is replied, God is not obliged by virtue of his desire for salvation to remove, by miraculous intervention, all individual impediments which arise in the world uh, created by him. These impediments arise from the created secondary causes which have been established by the divine prime cause and which in many cases make vain the execution of the divine desire for salvation. There is also the possibility that God, in an extraordinary manner, remits original sin to those children who die without baptism and communicates grace to them, as his power is not limited by the church's means of grace. However, the existence of such an extra-sacramental communication of grace cannot be proved." Unquote. So, as we see here, there's a potential ammunition for both sides of the debate, as there should be, since the true uh, position, in my opinion, lies somewhere in the middle, and that is, on the one hand, God is by no means obligated uh, in any sense to bestow baptismal grace upon infants who die uh, without the sacrament. And if there are, in fact, infants who die in a state of original sin, uh, this would not uh, damage God's justice in any respect. On the other hand, we know for certainty that God does not demand the impossible. And since God does, in fact, have a universally uh, salvific will, it is not as if there are no possible means by which such infants can be saved. Uh, God is not bound by his sacraments, and since there are extra sacramental means of receiving the grace of baptism for adults, uh, surely there are possible extra sacramental channels of baptismal grace for infants. To say that God cannot supply this as a divine remedy for a premature death uh, would be, in my opinion, to deny his omnipotence implicitly. That said, uh, it would be incorrect to presume with uh, absolute theological certitude that he would intervene in this way. Nevertheless, given his universal salvific will, and given the fact that he does not demand the impossible, I think we can have a reasonable hope that God would infuse in such infants the remission of original sin by way of extra-sacramental baptismal grace. And this uh, we can and should pray for earnestly. While the doctrine of limbo must be affirmed insofar as it safeguards the absolute necessity of baptism and uh, its removal of original sin for salvation, this affirmation uh, should only be seen as binding in a conditional sense, um, granting for the sake of argument the factual existence of infants dying in the state of original sin. But whether the state of affairs actually plays out in reality is unknown, and it is easy uh, to, in an orthodox manner, conceive of a scenario in which uh, there are no cases of this in actual fact, since God could, in harmony with his universal salvific will and divine love of souls, uh, he could, as Ludwig Ott speculates, simply infuse in such souls uh, sanctifying grace before they depart, thus securing for them what they desire by nature, uh, which is to enjoy the vision of God for all eternity. Well, this is more or less uh, the position laid out by the recent Vatican Declaration on the issue. I don't think that declaration takes enough care in affirming the doctrine of limbo in a conditional sense, thereby fending off the possibility of Pelagianism. Now, that said, while we should affirm uh, the doctrine of limbo as a conditional, we should pray, uh, and I think we can have a reasonable hope, uh, to borrow a phrase from Balthazar, except in this case it's correct use of it, um, that this conditional never actually passes from potency to act, and that God will see to it that those infants who die without the sacrament will, nevertheless, still be admitted by the same grace which animates the sacrament to begin with. Um, so I think that's the best way to sort of tackle this issue in a way that uh, I think is simultaneously comforting and doctrinally uh, I'm compromising. So I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, if you've thought about this issue, I hope uh, I help you maybe think about it a bit more clearly. Um, let me know what you think of the comments. Uh, as I said, I am continuing those projects that uh, I talked about in the last couple of videos, finishing uh, the Dionysius series, the Orthodox series, as well as other things. So those should be coming out 
within these coming weeks. Uh, so if you liked the video, give it a like, uh, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.